Markets around the world just freaked out again, and the reason is because the Jackson Hole Symposium and, of course, Jerome Powell's speech is just around the corner. Will we see signs of another rate hike? And at the same time, what do mutual funds need the market to do? Well, according to Goldman Sachs, it turns out most of them are underperforming majorly during 2023, and they might need a pullback in the market. So what better time to do it than over August and September, the two weakest months of the year? continue to be pretty weak. Massive rejections from the 20 moving average as we discussed in the previous video. And of course, we saw yields go back up to very dangerous levels. If this continues, and of course, sell-offs continue such as the big Nvidia drop, then we might be having some troubles. Today, we discuss markets around the world, including stocks, commodities, and cryptos together. Well, welcome back everyone to The Daily Show where we talk about markets around the world. And of course, we're covering the macro leading indicators and hottest charts. If you like stocks, commodities and cryptos, they're all coming up. And remember to subscribe and smash that like button if you find value in today's video. Let's begin with what happened over the last 24 hours. And it was a movement across the board, mostly in technology stocks, but really it was a broad based sell off. But before we get into the dark pool transactions and the large things that happened, I want to just talk about ECB balance sheets and of course the balance sheets of central banks because they're continuing to tighten across the board. The ECB, look at this, it's actually done some of the most tightening of any of the central banks in the world. And you can see when you put it on a chart as central bank assets as a share of GDP, that not only does it show you how bad the Bank of Japan really is, but it also tells you probably where eventually all of these central banks will end up, which is a lot higher. Unfortunately, you can always bet on the fact that central bankers will always inject to support economies and Bank of Japan is a clear representation of what's happened in the past. But for now, they're all tightening, except for look at this Fed. What's going on here? We've seen a bit of an increase in 2023, and that's been one of the main reasons, along with a few others, why these markets have been recovering. It's not as restrictive as we once thought when they claim they're doing something. Well, unfortunately, on the other end, we've got Bidenomics at the moment, which is really putting a huge amount of pressure on what the Fed's doing. Let's discuss NVIDIA versus the overall average target price analysis. And you can see here that $620 is the new target for NVIDIA after the earnings result. The only problem is the stock price ended up coming back down. So where will it go in the future? Well, I thought you might be interested in a chart such as this, and I do love these charts, which is basically overall the five-year history of PEs for NVIDIA. Is it expensive right now? Well, the answer is not really. It's basically around the same as it's always traded, very, very expensive. But do notice that we do get some big shifts in it. Now, if we can get it back down into a 30, possibly that could be something that you wanna look at. I always say the best way to price something like this is also looking at the Ford PE expectations of the market, which will bring up very soon for quite a few stocks as we've now basically finished the majority of the earnings season. Let's also discuss why these mutual funds are so far behind. Well, unfortunately, it turns out the Magnificent Seven has done about plus 58% this year. The S&P about plus 15, and the rest of the 493 companies only plus 4%. So it's not really an entire economy coming with the market this year. It's more anything to do with the word AI. And of course, these are huge companies. If they start to fall, it's gonna put a lot of pressure on markets. Let's discuss equity risk premium as well. Basically at the moment, we're seeing that hit to lowest levels really for a very long time. And of course, Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson, he's talked about this several times as a factor that needs to be considered as an investor. If you're able to get basically around 4.3-ish percent with risk-free rate, which is something around the US 10 year at the moment, that is effectively the discount model for businesses. So in this case, what we're looking at is really a market where no one is considering any risk in equities, any risk in any of these investments. And it's almost better in some ways to sit in cash and bonds. And that's why you're seeing a lot of mutual funds doing it. The only problem for the mutual funds is they're falling behind because market price action has still been incredibly strong. Remember, markets can remain irrational longer than we can often remain solvent. We've updated a couple of charts here for us as well. Seasonal trends of the S&P 500 heading into September. This is over the last seven pre-election years. And you can see that we've had that uptick, but overall we're still adjusting pretty well to the current year. And you can see that realistically 2023 has just been more of an aggressive version of 
the normal pre-election years. Now, if we take every year into consideration, the worst is still to come. According to what generally happens, September usually is the worst month and the beginning of October tends to be the turnaround period. Will that be the same this year? Well, of course, time will tell, but we're looking at some key price action levels a little bit later on for the S&P. And if they do break underneath, we could be looking at quite a significant further sell-off in markets. We also know that the volatility continues through. This is pre-election years over the last 33 years. But basically, if you're looking at a chart normally, it, it shows a huge amount of increase and then it starts to decrease around middle of October again. So the VIX might continue to potentially show itself the problem is with zero DTEs at the moment, the VIX is partially broken. So what ends up happening is we have to use the volatility of the volatility, and I'll show you how to do that soon on this show. Let's talk about S&P 500 performance moving forward. Even if we continue to see August and September weaken, should we be worried about October, November, December? Historically, no. When we've put in a plus 10% for the start of the year, we've won 12 and 0 generally, which means that even if markets keep getting worse, there usually is a turn on the cards at some point, and we'll have to be looking at it together, hopefully being able to spot that. Another couple of things that happened over the last 24 hours were some unusual trade activities. The first one here was AAPL. So we saw Apple actually sell off and then put in a decent size order. Now it is possible this is actually a buy, and although that sell off is brutal, we could be coming back to a fib that could allow purchasing. A lot will be told, and if we do end up getting a turn, especially making you high, I wouldn't discount this bubble at all in terms of a big purchase. This could mean that we are actually moving quite a lot higher initially, and we need to be paying attention to that. But for now, the markets still look down, and of course, we have seen some decent selling through the queues as well over the last 24 hours, which we kind of alluded to possibly being in the last video. So go back and check that if you want to around middle of the video. Let's also discuss options activity. Where was the biggest activity? Well, no surprise, Nvidia got a lot of options on it. It was 2.56 times the 90 day average. We saw 1522 versus 1 million 59 puts. So really it was a huge amount of calls. Most likely that's retail and people getting excited about it. But if the semiconductors aren't able to find recovery soon, this could be a bit of a problem. A lot of these were short dated. We continue to see also a few other pretty interesting stocks coming up. We've got things like Enphase and Broadcom and, of course, also things like Zoom and other hyper-growth stocks finding a decent amount of options trade. But let's scroll down here, and we still have 51% calls on a pretty big down day. That shows us that the buy-the-dip reflex is still pretty strong. Remember, only five months ago, this would have been about 65 60% puts. Now it's 51% calls, 49% puts. So it is possible that we could keep selling off. And what I keep seeing with the options is that everybody's buying October puts. There's October puts everywhere. And when we get into discussing September more, and of course October and maximum pain, I think that might become quite an interesting area for us to look at because it looks like October could be that point which is gonna have a flaw in it where markets will not be able to go down. Remember what we said just a little while ago that we tend to move up in October? Well, if we keep selling off, it, I tell you, it makes a pretty good case for moving forward before max pain, which is the third week in option expiration during that month. Let's talk about what was good and what was bad over the last 24 hours. It turns out semiconductors and tech gave back most of what they put on, if not a bit more. And we saw things like regional banks, gold, and financials actually come through. It wasn't defensives. Utilities, staples, and healthcare just did not come with the pack. And this kind of is the same thing as the last five days now. Gold's now the number one performer, although it still doesn't look exceptional on the charts. And while semiconductors gave back a lot of what they gained, they're still up 2.27% over that period. So yeah, defensives are not leading this, which could show you that the market is not really super defensive in nature at this stage. We need to be paying attention to that one. US 20, US 10, and US 30 year yields. Make sure you're marking all the highs so you're aware if those do happen. We did see a little bit of a pickup into the Jackson Hole Symposium. This is probably gonna move over the next 24 hours as, as we see Jerome Powell's speech, but I would be setting alerts for new lows and new highs just in case. It's gonna make a fairly decent uh, difference to not only equities, but also things like treasuries. So the 20 moving average was exceptional. I've got to say, 
it worked like a charm across so many pairs. And when we look at one of the indices later on, if you pause the video here and you guess which one I talked about yesterday, it was an exceptionally good entry point. And that was for a short. Now, treasuries have sold off a little bit here from the 20, and we're looking still at what happens next. Of course, this is the big question mark. If we make a new low, we're thinking we're going towards 88.90 for treasuries and that that could be a solidified bottom here for investors. And at this stage, we don't have a turn point. What we wanna be marking is a few things on charts now. We wanna mark something like a 97.36. We obviously wanna mark a new low and you probably wanna mark something like a gap close. Treasuries are starting to get very interesting, though they're not quite at levels that we like just yet. Let's move over to JP10Y, how's it going? Well, it's continued to raise up, but it's not above 0.7 yet. Make sure you set alerts, keep on top of that one. The skew keeps coming down and that's a good sign for bears. So people that have been watching this channel for a while would know we look at the skew. We've been looking at BPSPX as well, which is another code and for something else, which is the bullish percent or bullish strength index. And what, what's happening here is the skew is basically getting crushed. And this is the sign that you usually want to see for a nice pullback. If you think about it, we got one back here in March and we also got one back in August and it really bottomed the market when we got a turn back up for the SKU. So we're looking for turns to back up. At this stage, we don't have one, but we will be continuing to watch that particular indicator. Copper did weaken 20 moving average again on the daily. Not much more to say about that, but here's the US dollar. This thing just keeps strengthening. We talked about the chance that this might turn here. Now in the private community video that I did yesterday, I said that I didn't think this was actually gonna hold. And the reason why is we took a closer look at the Euro and a closer look at the pound. It turned out both of them had pretty strong sales on them and the dollar made a new high. And it's coming into a critical point now for the markets. Is this a turning area? It could be, but if it gets through this, you know, the dollar is gonna push even higher, you would think, Next stop for it's gonna be about 105.64 on the resistance. So critical zone, watching the dollar very closely, not trying to sell it off just yet. We haven't seen a proper swing trade turn down or anything like that. Now with dollar strength, you'd think that gold would be weakening. At the moment, gold broke this downward channel that we talked about the other day. It's getting a little stronger, but overall, oh, I've got to say there is there is no really good trade yet um, in these markets. So I think the gold is, you know, can make a case for both bullish and bearish here, and we have to be paying attention to it. Now on the stocks themselves, I think we've got clearer levels. This one up here, which we marked last time, 29.80. We're gonna be watching that very closely. Notice where we came back to last 24 hours, the daily 20 moving average. Almost everything went back to the daily 20 moving average and everything was rejecting it. But gold can do okay if we keep getting a bit of a sell-off, especially if it's not due to yields breaking those new highs. Remember, if US 10, 20, and 30-year yields break out, we're not going to like gold at that point. US oil came down, tested the lows again, and found a bit of a rally. It looks like it's put in a temporary double bottom here. I could see it doing something like this. But overall, yeah, I would say US oil is still struggling, and it does look like it's putting a swing to the downside. So we're looking towards maybe a bit of bullishness here for a little while, maybe get back to that 20 moving average, something like that. And then, because that's a tweezer, of course, for the lows and then possibly turn down. Now, if it gets underneath this level, it's gonna be significant. I would think next move would be $74 a barrel. So a level underneath 77.60, put an alert maybe, have a look at the technicals, look at your systems. It could be a very interesting point. We'll move over to Apple now and we'll talk about this one. And of course you can see here that Apple got very close to the 20 and then sold off. It was a very critical level. And of course it was a big sell. I mean, 2.62%, the biggest stock in the world is nothing to sneeze at. It happened just after where I thought it would, which is around here, which is the level I was targeting. And then the 20 just gets hit in that pre-market and then gets sold off aggressively. Now, if you're a bull on Apple, you're going to like this level. And there's a few reasons why, but I'll just put a fib on here and you'll see that we're very close to the 61.8 pullback, often considered a turn point. So I think bulls are gonna be very closely watching the next open because there are quite a few stocks to be made that the case for that even though we rejected the 20, which was probably pretty feasible, we had a one, two, three, four kind of rally day that there could be a buyer in here. Now, if we get a new low, of course, I think we're going down to something like a 162, 
which is going to be a large sell-off. And that's going to push some good levels for the S&P 500 as well. 4150, 4200 might be pushed at that point. And it's going to be, I think, a pretty cool level for us to be able to watch. Now, if Apple is able to get a new high, I'd realistically be looking for the gap. So I like two looking trades here. You can place both. You could kind of think about both positions in your own mind. And the way that you want to be thinking of all these markets right now is will these levels over the next 24 hours hold, the Jackson Hole Symposium? We also know ARC is big zone, big trend line. Not that I like ARC at all. I think it's a pretty bad investment device. However, it just shows you hyper growth stocks and they're all back down to pretty key critical zones across the board. Semiconductors also sold big rally. It was going to be a lot bigger. It was going to be like 160 before the open. Then it started selling and it sold and it sold and it sold. And it's a pretty aggressive sell-off. New lows will mark big significant changes for the market. And again, 4150, 4200 would be the next zone. It almost looks like a head and shoulders at this point. You could you could make the argument left shoulder, head, right shoulder in terms of where it's all going. And that's something that we could look at here in the markets. Meta is another one that's, of course, weakening off here. Not quite to the daily 20, but showing signs of weakness coming back underneath that trend line. And if we load up Tesla, this one was probably the better trade of the session, which was just further selling, especially pre-market. You could have got it, I think, about 241, 242. And it was uh, just a sell-off from this point here. Now, we talked about this in the last video, and we said that if we could make a new low and close, We'd be basically be putting in a little double top. So at this stage, you know, look for that. Another sign of a new close. Push down, get to 215. We're obviously looking for 200, 210 daily. Daily 200 moving average would be nice, and that still sits at around 200. dollars So this would be a good level, if not a little bit lower. Nice pullback here for Tesla so far. For bulls, you guys need to really find a lot of strength, pretty much off this zone. Push through 240. And then, of course, keep moving up. German market. Now, if you guessed correctly, if you knew that this was the one I was going to bring up, this was, oh, that was a good trade, guys. Uh, now, this was an exceptionally good zone, and I really liked it. I even slithered it um, on the box. Now, I did say I really, really, really like it, and that's because it was, yeah, an exceptionally good drop, by, drop base drop. And it had a lot of things to do with uh, our day trading masterclass. You know, quick plug if you're interested in checking it out. Links in the description down below. But this is, you know, a very replicatable type of trade. And I like that one. It ended up going 2.16. You would have got more in the NASDAQ. But this was the best entry of the day, in my opinion. I, I would give that one uh, probably, you know, almost a 9. 9 out of 10 in terms of how good it was. Now, what happens next is the next question. It is going to be a little bit more difficult. Because we're back down in these lows. We're pressuring it now one time, two times, three times, and this is a fourth. I mean, technically, it's a third recently. And if we do get underneath, then, of course, that really instigates what we know is probably a wipe off at this point. Buyers Climax, UT, UTAD, and then we've had a nice sell-off, nice rally, good sell off the 20. You know, it doesn't look strong. Um, I would probably wait for more information both ways and then make decisions. I like to be patient, react, don't predict. For people that took the short, it'd be a good point to break even maybe scale back, those types of things you could do. Chinese market held pretty firm. So this is the CQQ just holding its lows, waiting for, of course, stimulus potentially. And the Australian market was not going up as much as I thought. I thought it might be able to get to these ribbons and then sell, but it just kind of sitting in the range. Still not made a big decision here of what the next move is. We'll continue to watch the Aussie market. Let's move over to the US though. It looks like a carbon copy. This one again, is it a flag? Is it a downward declining flag? What's going to happen next with it? We can't really tell from the Russell 2000, but the markets we do want to be looking at is the NASDAQ and the S&P. They look a lot better. So the NASDAQ just got slashed. Like this thing was way higher, but you can see here again, daily 20 moving average, couldn't hold it, sold off, engulfed backwards. Now, if I put a FIB, and I'm going to use the futures for this, if I put a FIB on the low to the high, we're going to get it deeper than a 61.8 pullback at this stage. But this is where, again, if bulls are going to try to pick it up, it's right here. We saw the same with AAPL, the biggest stock in the world. We've seen the same with NASDAQ. It doesn't look like that because, of course, these three or four day rallies are symbols usually of bear markets. And when we've seen them in the past, like they looked here with these aggressive moves up and we've been selling off before, 
what generally happens when you get these one, two, threes is you get usually a new low. And here's another example of a market here, one, two, three, four, really strong, new low comes. Now it does come back to the Fed and Jackson Hole Symposium, but there's some of the things that we've seen before. And a few of you, I can already tell what you're gonna be saying, that's the head and shoulders I was looking for. Well, whenever you're looking at a head and shoulders pattern, I always like to proof it, which is the head to, of course, the neckline. And if we actually take this out, let's see what that would be predicting. So that would be predicting, funnily enough, a return back to the structure of April and May. Now that might put a smiley face on some people's faces. If this happens during the weakest month of the year, September, it would make sense for where those mutual funds, that's why I put them in here today, might be wanting to have a look at the markets and say, well, hey, well, I, I missed out on all of this. Now I need to get into it. Of course, that's still a lot of percentage away. It's not necessarily the way it's gonna work. It's 12.4% from this point, but it's an interesting theory at least. Daily 20 moving average again here for the S&P. Nice movements. Again, we've seen so many great touches of this. This thing's respecting it so much at this stage. Huge sell-off. Again, pull of fib, you'll find that it's at a deeper point, which could mean that buyers are looking around here. Though I would say if buyers do come in, there still could be sellers pressing something like a 4440, 4430 zone. So do be wary of a lot of the action here into the Jackson Hole Symposium. Kind of expecting a bit of whipsaw, but if we do get a day close underneath 43.30, my next stop, at least from a technical perspective, would be around 4,200. So it's about 130 point loss after that point. And I think that's the most interesting trade at this stage. If we did close where we are right now in terms of weekly, you can see how bad it would look. And of course it would be pressuring that 20 exponential moving average that we've got here on the chart. But yeah, that would be a very weak look for the markets. And of course, it would generally ensue that there is further selling pressure coming. Think about these weeks in the past and what's happened a few days later. We'll be watching and of course, we'll be paying a lot of attention to this in our special weekend edition. So make sure to subscribe if you're interested in that. Bitcoin, boring, nothing much going on. Unfortunately, it still continues to coil at these lows. We don't know. I wanted to either take a low and then move up. Or at this stage, I'm looking for it to just kind of pure sell. I mean, obviously, someone's probably trying to buy the dip. The thing is, it's not really being bought. So we're looking for the stages of a turnaround, and we just don't have them yet. I'll be watching. Of course, we'll be talking about it together very, very soon. Now, why do we need to be careful? Well, of course, it is this bit of information. The Fed Chair Powell speaking, 10.05 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time during day two of the Jackson Hole Symposium. And we also have the ECB coming out at 3 p.m. in the afternoon to have a bit of a chat. When you've got central bankers talking, we need to pay attention. Obviously, what they do moves the markets. And we'll come back to you once we've got that information. And hopefully, we can have the patience to react to it and get some nice entries. Thanks so much, everybody. Subscribe if you like the content. And of course, give it a thumbs up if you do enjoy what we do. Bye for now.